I'm the head of the business statistics uh, division within uh, Office for National Statistics. And as I said, it's my pleasure here to have you here and to chair this event today. As usual, being chair, I need to do the necessaries with housekeeping and point out that there is no fire drill planned for today. So if we hear um, an alarm, then we need to evacuate the building. We will be asked to go out, the, out of the, the room here, of course, up the stairs that you came down, out to the front of the building, and then down to the right, to the left, and then there's a square with a park area that we will congregate in should we need to. If for any reason you can't easily make it up the stairs, then we will have somebody outside that will help evacuate anybody uh, to an alternative exit. But as I said, there's no um, a, a test plan, so if we do hear something, we will need to, uh, to act. Just a, a few ground rules, if you like. I mean, we are very tight for time today, so if we can do our, our best to, to come back on time from coffee and, uh, and obviously lunch as well. Um, there's lots of stuff around that we that we're very keen for you to see and to provide us with feedback on. We've got the new um, ONS theme pages, at least a, a, a prototype of those over in the corner. We'll be showing the uh, virtual microdata laboratory. We've got Stats Usernet being shown, various other things being uh, demoed throughout the break and throughout the day. So please take some time if you can to have a look at those and provide us with some feedback. And we've also been working hard as an office on, on things like commentary. There's, uh, there's some copies of the new retail sales release out there, old versions, new versions, and again, uh, any feedback on those would be, uh, would be welcome. Give, at least give you a feel for the sorts of things that we are, that we are working on currently. Um, you've each got a pack. In that pack is a, a number of things, a delegate list. There's a, a very exciting looking button. Um, it's something that we will use for voting, and we will do that throughout the course of the day. We hope the technology works. We've tested it to destruction, um, but who knows? We'll, we'll give it a go. Um, if you do leave early, obviously, please um, return those voting pads. I expect uh, whilst we borrowed them from the Welsh Government, they would be less happy if we didn't return them. Um, uh, so please leave them behind. There's either a, a box on your way out or leave them on the chairs and we'll pick them up later. Um, okay, let's do a little test of the technology, first of all. So if you want to find your little buzzer pads and we'll see how it works. It's a good, also, a good opportunity also to see how much we really do know um, about business statistics. Um, I, I will confess I got this wrong. When I, when I answered this question myself I got it wrong. So uh, uh, let's see how we do. So we're going to test this technology. Oh actually I didn't get this one wrong. I can answer that question. Um, first of all if you can tell us which sector you're from and we'll get a good feel for uh, the distribution of, of people in the room. I shall start voting any moment, and then you will have 10 seconds to cast your vote. Okay, let's see. So just over half of the people in the room are from central government, so that will be the producers and users of official statistics from within central government. Obviously, we've got a good spread as well from, from other parts um, from other user, parts of the user community, so local government, industry and so on. So this is the sort of technology that we will use on and off throughout the day. Uh, and as I say, hopefully it will keep working. Now one that is slightly more testing. Right, how much did manufacturing contribute to the total uh, gross value added in 2011? You both seem to open that. Okay, so 32 of you said 11%, that's less than half. The correct answer is 11%. So it's surprising, isn't it? I mean, I, I think a lot of people know and understand how there's been this shift from manufacturing to the service sector. Um, and yet, I think they will be surprised when, when they hear that the, the actual contribution to overall gross value added is lower than 11%, not to say that, of course, manufacturing isn't important. Um, but yes, people are often surprised, I think, when they, when they see some of these numbers. So the technology works. Uh, we'll return to this through the, through the course of the day. Um, I think that's all I need to say by way of uh, introduction to the event. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy the day. And please take the chance to fill in your feedback forms, either during the course of the day uh, or at the end. Without any further ado, of course, it's my pleasure to welcome Andrew Dillnock, our keynote speaker. Um, 
Andrew Dillon, Dillon was awarded the CBE in 2000 and became chair of the UK Statistical Authority uh, in April 2012. Um, so welcome, Andrew. We're very keen to hear uh, what you've got to say about the changing shape of UK business. Thank you. I became chairman of the UK Statistics Authority on April the 1st. <coughs> Come on, wake up everybody. It's <laughs> not that deep. No. It's not that hard. Um, this stuff really matters. Uh, all statistics really matter. The collection and presentation of statistics really matters. Their communication really matters. But above all, their use really matters. There's no point in the marvellous uh, people who work in the GSS and the ONS in the private sector, there's no point in people generating data that doesn't get used. Um, the reason we're interested in producing it, the reason we care about how it's communicated is so it can be used. Use is all that matters. If it, if it weren't being used, then we really literally might as well just stop. Now, most of you will know, many of you will have been a part of the assessment process that's just finished of all national statistics in the UK, and that's an extraordinary achievement on the part of, of my current colleagues, my predecessors, uh, the Statistics Authority, actually to have done all of this assessment, and it, it's great to live in a country where uh, there is independence of stati in statistical work to the extent that we have here, and that assessment process by and large was pretty positive about the statistics themselves, about the underlying statistical methodology lack of political interference. There are a few things it wasn't positive about. One of the things it wasn't positive about was engagement with users. That pretty much across the whole range of uh, national statistics, there was a sense that more could be done to engage with users. And this process is a part of that. And that's why, speaking personally from the Statistics Authority perspective, I'm so delighted that, that this is going on, so delighted that there are so many people here. Because it, it, it really, really is the case. We really, really mean it. We want to know what users want uh, so that we can try to serve their needs. Um, and there are lots of different people here today. Uh, we, haven't got, we haven't got photographs of uh, examples of users from these various uh, sectors, apart from the general public, because, um, well, we didn't think you'd look terribly nice on screen, actually. We think these are probably more attractive. Um, it's, it, it's very important, though, to be aware of this diversity of users. The, um, the, one of the games that Jason's already played, we asked where people came from. And you know, we all saw there was, a, there was a predominance of central government, but only about half of the group even here today. And it absolutely is not the case that at the Statistics Authority or in the legislation, central government is in any sense the primary user. It's a very, very important user, but it is not the primary user. My own sense is that the, the most important user of all, in the end, is the citizen user, the member of the public. Most of that use, of course, is mediated either through journalism or through the various employing organisations in which people are employed. But, but in the end, we're here to serve the public good. That's what official statistics are there for. And one of the ways in which we can serve the public good is by serving the users of business statistics. And, and those statistics get used in all kinds of ways to make all these sorts of decisions. There aren't really very many decisions at all that will optimally be made without some data being involved. We want some information before we can make almost any decision. And when it comes to a, a decision about anything that affects business, anything at all, you're going to need some data. It may not always be official data, but you're going to need some data. And, and we should be bold about that. One of the things I'm very keen to see is statisticians being proud of what they do and being bold in their organisations. So I want to see statisticians in central government and in local government, but also in business, both small and large, both manufacturing and services, both high-tech and not so high-tech, actually trying to make the case for the need for, the use for, the insight that we can draw from statistics. So let's be a little bit more bold than sometimes we are. Now, one obvious area where 
uh, you might think of business being interested is the economy. And I'm not going to talk too much about the economy because um, because I could go on and on and on about the economy. So I promise only one economic slide. This is one of my favourite economic slides at the moment, which just shows the this recession. Um, so the current recession caught just from the pre-recession peak where we are now and, and to point out that actually GDP is has, has not recovered uh, anything like as quickly, we think, as it did in any of these past recessions, even going back to 1930 to 34. So if you look at GDP, then it is indeed the case that this was a pretty nasty recession. But one of the points I want to make here, and that I guess will come through some of the other presentations today, is that it's easy to think that simple summary statistics will tell us all we need to know. GDP is an astonishing aggregate, and we really are putting everything together. It's like trying to summarise the UK economy in a single number. And that's not always going to be very meaningful. If we wanted to think about what kind of recession this was, you know, one way we can measure it is how much did GDP fall. That's not necessarily the only or the most interesting way. For members of the public, what's happened to unemployment might be at least as interesting. And actually, unemployment on both ways of defining it has grown massively less quickly in this recession than it did in the last two recessions. Or we might be interested in house repossessions or uh, how happy people are feeling or not, or even business liquidations, and we'll come on to some of that later. So, so there's an enormous wealth of economic statistics, and one of the things that I suspect is perhaps more true of business users than of the media or the public at large is an interest in trying to get beyond some of these headline statistics, and that's something that we're very keen to hear about. So, so if there are aspects of economic statistics that you think we could give more prominence to, or perhaps even might do differently, please let us know, because that matters a great deal to us. Um, Early in my life, I spent 20 years working at the IFS, and, and for much of that time I worked mainly on businesses. <coughs> Sorry, I may, worked mainly on households rather than businesses. Counting households is quite straightforward and makes sense. We can count businesses. There are, we think, roughly 4.8 million businesses in this country. But it's not so obvious that a business is a really interesting unit. So households are interesting and comparable units, quite easy to compare across households. Uh, defining a household is relatively straightforward, although probably becoming less straightforward than it was. Defining a business, you know, defining the edge of a business, working out whether a business is one business or many, what the relationships between businesses are, and then looking at the astonishing diversity of businesses makes work in this area, I think, quite a lot more challenging than work in the household sector. In households, we've got a natural unit that is comparable, a natural thing to describe and define. In the case of businesses, we just haven't. It's true that there are 4.8 million of them, but they're not really alike in all kinds of different ways. The, um, the 4.8 million employ, we think, nearly 24 million people. That's not very many each. On average, that's just five each, and five each is not, very, is, is not a very large number. Uh, the dispersion, though, is absolutely massive. The number of businesses has been increasing over time. So from, we think, about three and a half million in 2000 to the 4.8 or so now. Now, that's a pretty rapid change in the number. And that, you know, that's a pretty big change in not a very long period. And that's a reminder to us of something that Jason's already talked about a bit, which is the fluidity of this whole sector, the fluidity of the economy, the speed with which change occurs. And one of the things that we're putting more effort into when thinking about statistical communication is the importance of setting the most up-to-date data in the context of time series that give people, that give you a sense of the change that's been going on. It's something that I think the wider public, perhaps you also policy makers, certainly in the public sector, and my guess is in the private sector as well, find it hard to recognise. It's easy to underestimate the extent of change, but actually there's a great deal of change going on all the time. I mentioned this briefly earlier on, this is liquidations. Um, so the, the, 
grey shaded bars are when the economy is shrinking. Um, and you can see that there is a relationship between the overall performance of the economy and the number of company liquidations rose very dramatically in the early 1990s and then persisted at a very high level even once the economy had started growing again, dropped right down, oscillated a bit in the 2000s, J did jump in 2008-9, although again by rather less than in the early 2000s recession, has stayed at a reasonably high level, although not as high as it was in the early part of the 1990s. So you know, it's another way in which we can get some sense of what's going on, but all of these are necessarily incomplete measures of what's happening. And this starts to, to talk a bit more about what I, what I mentioned earlier on, that the businesses are very diverse, and it's not always clear that talking about businesses will help us. This chart shows us for uh, zero employee businesses, that's in so essentially sole traders, what happened to the number of those. The number of those has increased by about 50% in the last decade or so. The number of large businesses, 250 plus, has declined by about 10%. The number of businesses in the 1 to 249 has gone up by about 12%. So, so significant shifts dominated by a big growth in the number of essentially sole traders, and we'll say a little bit more about that later on. And then we see this reduction in the number of very large employers, but that doesn't really tell us enough. We don't yet know from that slide whether that reduction is because there's been agglomeration in the business sector, so big businesses have been joining together, or because big businesses have been failing. So we can't actually tell from a slide like that whether this is a reflection of success or failure, good times or bad, but we can see that there is something quite dramatic going on. And some of this relates to something that I expect you may well talk about some more later on, which is the whole kind of productivity puzzle, GDP conundrum, uh, that quite a lot of effort's been going to understand recently, that we've seen GDP bobbling along flat or possibly even slightly going down until recently, while employment has continue to go. There's been quite a lot of work done by colleagues at the ONS trying to help to understand that. And my own sense, and I'm, I'm thinking back to my, my life as an economist, is that actually we shouldn't necessarily, and of course it's possible that there's a problem there somewhere, but it's also actually conceivable for all sorts of potential reasons that this may actually reflect what's happening. It's a reminder that you know, employment is employment change is a number that doesn't have any prices associated with it. Uh, GDP is about prices. GDP is essentially what happens when you multiply inputs by the price associated with them. And you know, so it's completely conceivable that we can have patterns of change like that that we've seen in GDP and employment persisting for a little bit of time. So saying a little bit more about this issue of, of the difference in structure. Um, if you look at two different measures of, of businesses, one measure is just the number of businesses, another way of thinking about them is turnover. Well, uh, most businesses are very small. In three quarters of businesses have only one employee, or no employees, or a single person. Um, by the time you get up to um, businesses with 50 to 249 employees, there appear to be almost none of them, but you can just about see that there are some. There's a very, very thin tail blue bar. So there are a few businesses with 50 to 249 employees, and they're responsible for quite a lot of overall turnover, 10 to 20% overall turnover. But in this group, there's 250 plus businesses that is most interesting because there appear not to be any of them. And there are so few of them that you can't actually see how many there are, but they're responsible for this massive price of turnover. And when we're doing statistical work, either analyzing or collecting, we have to be alert to both the distribution of numbers and turnover. Uh, and of course, that, that, that probably means, I don't know, but my guess is that means that if you're one of those very small number of businesses up here, you're going to get a lot of questionnaires to fill in. We're going to be talking to you quite a lot because actually if we're to understand the whole economy, then this very small number of very, very large businesses uh, is rather important and we, we, we have to keep coming at it 
uh, one of the things that I hope that this whole community, particularly the non-government business community, can do is help your, your colleagues in the private sector understand how important all of this data is so to bear with us in terms of the burden that we understand in providing data. This, this um, relationship between business, num business numbers and turnover, of course, you know, varies by sector, and so this is just another way of slicing it. Um, the private sector services tend to be, according to this data, on average rather smaller than some, some others. Construction also, lots of relatively small companies. Manufacturing, though, tends to be uh, the relationship between turnover and But of course, that's turnover, not profit. If rather than turnover, we had profit, that might look very different. Because if you're in wholesale and retail, then an awful lot of your turnover is just in and out because the office is taking stuff from elsewhere. So we've got lots and lots of different ways of slicing this data up, many more than I can talk about this morning. And one of the things that I hope we'll get from today, partly in the sessions, partly in more informal feedback, is a sense of what the dimensions where you're interested in slicing the data are, and I'm in particular whether there are any <coughs> we're not telling you what's going on. Uh, this relates back to Jason um, forcing you to do multiple choice questions. I'm delighted to see that more and more people are torturing their audiences in uh, discussions about statistics. This is a pretty big change. Um, in, in probably in the lifetime of everybody, you know, I don't think there's anybody here, well no, actually I think there's one or two offensively useful people here who were born after 1978, but in most of our lifetimes, this change has occurred, and it's a pretty dramatic change, and it's a change that isn't well understood, is not well represented by media understanding of our economy, not represented well by public understanding, or I think by public policy understanding. You know, the, the notion that, you know, so e even in this group, it'd be hard to find a more expert group than this, but half of this group was wrong about the size of the manufacturing sector. Uh, and wrong by quite large amounts. So half of this group found the correct answer, 11%, simply implausible. Well, how do we think that the wider world, which is nothing like so immersed in this data as this group is, thinks about the future of the economy? And of course, it's not helped by the fact that whenever there's a story about the economy, newspapers and the television are tempted to put up a picture of a factory. Um, you know, that doesn't help us. Um, of course, we don't have very easy ways of representing other forms of activity. But it, it, changes like these really, really matter. Now, change is going to carry on. You know, the economy is going to go on changing. It's going to go on changing pretty rapidly. That's certainly what we learn as we look backwards. You know, economies change pretty fast. Uh, we're quite good at adapting. That means we're going to need to change the areas where we're collecting data in a way in which we collect data. There have been lots of changes already. The new standard industrial classification, massively more ways of categorizing the service sector, for example. Uh, we need to keep up to date with all of that. We need to recognize that while there's enormous value in consistent long-run time series, we also need to be on the lookout for new bits of the economy and new ways of measuring them. And we're, we're very keen to hear about all of those kinds of things today. The needs of users what we're here to think about during the whole of this conference. I don't think there's any, there's any question that over the last two decades, the needs of use haven't always been given the priority they deserve. And it's only by working together with the user community that as statistical producers, we have a chance of both doing what the Act requires us to do, which is to produce and publish statistics that serve the public good and also have them paid attention to. So we, we depend on this community. You are actually our lifeline, and we're, we're keen to show you some love, um, as long as you show us some love back. Uh, tell us what you want to, tell us what you want us to do. Tell us what puzzles you. Tell us what frustrates you about the way that we're working at the moment, because uh, as our closest friends, you can be perhaps 
more direct than some others. So I'm really delighted to be here. I, I'm particularly pleased to see how many people there are, particularly pleased to see the diversity of people here today. Um, very happy to take questions on anything I've talked about already and anything else related to statistics in the UK. And, and I hope the rest of the day is a huge success. Andrew, thank you very, very much for that introduction. And that is, uh, you know, there are lots of themes in there that we will be building on during the, the course of the day. But the, the main message, and, and I will reiterate that, I'm sure, many times, is, is tell us what you think. Tell us what, how you're using the data. Tell us what you would like in the future. And we'll have plenty of ways of, uh, of capturing that during the course of the day and then trying to play it back to you um, before we leave the room and, of course, then building on that when we get back to our offices. Um, I'd like to invite um, Siobhan Carey, if she is around, to come and join us uh, and the panel here. Um, I ought to introduce the panel. Um, we have, obviously, uh, Andrew, who, who we've just heard from. We have uh, Siobhan Carey, who is the head of uh, the statistics profession uh, within DID. We have Graham Walker, who's the uh, head of national accounts within the Office for National Statistics. And we've got Mark Robson, um, who is the head of statistics and regulatory data uh, for the Bank of England. So um, we would welcome for the next 15 minutes or so any questions you may have for any of the panel members. Uh, we'll answer what we can and if we can't answer them we'll take a question and try and provide you with an answer before the end of the day. And there are a couple of people that will be wandering around with, uh, with roving mics. Does anybody like to kick us off? on the way in which you've, sorry, somebody at the back there, would you like to take the microphone down to the back? If you could perhaps just say who you are, where you're from, and then ask your question, that'd be great, thank you. Great, thank you very much. I'm Harvey Gibson, President of Bank Group. Um, no, thank you very much. I mean, I, I hadn't seen the zero employee figures before, and, uh, and I'm dying for Kenny Ripson, I can't see him around, but uh, who's going to be talking about small small day or um, talk about small businesses in Scotland because you know, it really is interesting to see how uh, the business figures feed through to um, A, the GBA figures, which are what drives the economy really, and B, how they feed through to employment, which is what tends to drive the politicians. Uh, and zero employee businesses are a really interesting challenge in that. Um, but um, another challenge is the way that we deal with large businesses, um, and that's quite a lot influenced by the lengths we go to to conform with United Nations and Eurostat um, um, classification systems and, and definitional systems and so on. And there are some issues in that, like um, uh, how do you break up a big business into, into smaller units, which we touched on, Andrew, um, and particularly um, how do you classify its activities? I mean, we're in a ridiculous position in Scotland uh, that we have relatively no oil refineries. Um, and there are, you know, a lot of people living under the shadow of the, of, uh, the Drainsmouth refinery in Falkirk, which is, uh, which refines most of the North Sea oil, but we'd be very surprised uh, to hear that. Um, but that sets up a whole lot of problems, not just for business statistics, but for national accounting as well. Uh, and it's very important for us at the moment because we, um, in Scotland, are very concerned about our economic relationship with the rest of the United Kingdom for very, uh, very obvious reasons. So, you know, and that all stems out of the Eurostat classification which the UK has elected not to follow. Uh, so I'm interested in sort of what's driving the strategic reasons behind uh, business statistics uh, and how much that's the wishes of the current government, how much it's the Statistics Act, how much it's international conventions uh, and those kinds of issues. And I think that's the, that's the area that I'd be interested in you from the whole panel. Thank you. Okay. I'll who do I pose this question to? And it seems kind of quite appropriate maybe that I uh, look to the head of national accounts for a uh, uh, first response on that one, Graham. Um, thank you for that. Um, clearly, 
there isn't a single definition of a business unit that is suitable for all purposes. So national accounts, rolling, company type level stuff. For regional or individual countries, you need um, a more disaggregate level. But the driver really for the way we collect the data is what businesses can provide. Quite often the range of information that we require you can't get about like individual sites. And so that's what drives our strategy, is really what people can provide. Thank you, Graham. Does anybody else on the panel like to make a comment? Andrew? Uh, I, mean, I, I can say, I don't know the details of this, but if uh, and something I've said it probably repeatedly, um, any interference in political systems <coughs> in the United Kingdom is, as I understand it, in contravention of the political service act in 2007. And if anybody in the Commonwealth, wherever she goes, find about this, please let me know. I wasn't talking about interference. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I accept that, and I think um, UKSA has been very um, delightfully, very vigilant in kind of sitting on that word. So, no, I was talking about the general direction and the availability of resources and things like that, which is a legitimate political thing for politicians to be involved in. Yeah, yeah, I, yes, I, yeah, I, I quite agree. And that is, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting you were suggesting that. I just wanted to underline the point that. that <coughs> I think there are issues about resources. Uh, I wouldn't talk about the owner crisis or the wider GSS crisis, but it's stress. You know, it's, it's difficult to do. The, the ONS budget uh, is £150 million a year. That's £3 a year per person uh, in a country where GDP is uh, maybe a bit more than £25,000. So the ONS budget is only about one ten thousand for social unfortunately. I mean, we're, we're using one ten thousand and analyze all the data and that make all the realities of decisions. And my own sense is actually it's a stress and there are some tough strategic decisions that the authority of the ONS may have to make about what we collect and how we do it. And, and one of the challenges we face is people like David Lee Shaw and over the next few years is to try to kind of be working out how using limited resources best to meet the needs of users. So, so, so now is Yes, I mean, I, I, I hope it's obvious, but of course, in listening to what people have to, to, uh, to say today about what the needs are of the future, we aren't going to be able to do everything. You know, there will be an exercise in prioritisation, and I think that will be an iterative, an iterative process. But having this dialogue, of course, is the, is the right place to start. Um, okay. Um, any other, uh, other, other questions? I, we've still got plenty of time, so feel free to uh, uh, ask away. Andrew. I can't believe there's a room full of experts. I feeling quite shy and introverted this morning. Um, there's one point I'm going to pick up from Andrew's presentation and one from Herbie's comments. Uh, the first thing is um, the definition of businesses. There are, as alluded to, lots of definitions, and there's a very big EU statistical effort come up with the definition of a single statistical unit. And it wouldn't surprise you, they cannot come to an agreement. And that's because you've got a whole range of suppliers and users from a micro to a macro level. So you've got an industrial interest, you've got a regional interest, you've got a national interest, and what's gathering a lot of momentum is an EU interest. So if you then decide that you're going to have a particular type of statistical unit, you classify bottom up or top down you will have the effect linking to what Herbie's mentioning. Scotland doesn't have a refinery, but it, hold on, I can see it when I look out my bedroom window. But it's the way you then classify the activity. You don't lose the activity, you lose the precision in the micro measurement of the activity. So that's one dimension in terms of the statistical unit. It's very important in terms of how we classify it. The second point is comparability. 
So the UK Statistical Office works with a whole range of internationally agreed classifications. In particular, the EU has a legislative requirement of a range of regulations. And in order to achieve comparability with us and our other colleagues in other countries, it's very important that we influence these. Otherwise, we get dictated by it. So the ONS and other government departments like HMRC, etc., are very proactive in influencing those discussions. So the comparability dimension is a very important one to take note of. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. I mean, I'd perhaps like to invite Siobhan um, from Biz to, to comment on you know, the international relationship and, and, and the, the, the comparability to that. I think Rosie has said that, you know, in terms of the classifications of the EU, it's got constant trade-offs between sort of the level of granularity we want and the ability to be able to summarise statistics. But what we've got is really complex business and enterprise structures which you are trying to make sense of without the complete response of one side and pay fees for the other. And the, the, the big trade-off there is that you end up smoothing out some of the stuff that you're actually interested in versus you know, being able to dig down. And that's, that's the last question I think goes on to get around you know, the ability to be able to produce a narrative around the big picture and then what happens when you go down a particular policy and you drill down to into sub-sectors or small spatial areas. Um, so I think the international element is really important because we do need to benchmark ourselves in another country and in particular in the EU, um, but also more broadly than that, and particularly on things like trade, um, where we need to be quick on that. Again, I'll ask Jason for that later on today. Um, but I think, you know, classic trade-off um, between lots of detail versus being able to um, draw big conclusions. Perhaps I could also invite Mark from the bank's perspective, you know, your view on comparability and the importance of that. Thank you very much. Um, so just for the benefit of those that don't know, uh, at the Bank of England, which is not a producer of official statistics, it's not part of central government, we have a very cool agreement with the ONS, whereby we produce the GDP and national account data for the Bank of England. colleagues are much more extensive users of official statistics than I am, and Tom is going to be talking uh, later about one aspect of that. But from our point of view, first of all, in dealing with uh, colleagues overseas, particularly at the European Central Bank, let's say, there is constant surprise, first, that we don't in this country have any register of businesses, nationally or locally, let alone any credit register. So uh, if I think about the number of times I've explained to people that most of the businesses that we see on Andrew's slide are in fact not in the, the PNSD, the private uh, non-commercial corporation sector at all, they're in households. Uh, they're in households because they're not structured as corporations and they're not quasi-corporations, they're not formal partnerships. So the sole traders, the husband and wife, informal family businesses, even quite large businesses, are all in households. And of course that affects the way that we think about the provision of credit clearing, uh, either uh, in fact or in the statistics. Certainly there's a mix of personal credit and business credit that is very hard to disentangle. Does that matter? Does it matter that we have a very different model from the continental one based on specific code procedures where everything gets registered and, uh, and, and ticks and crossed? I'm not really sure that it does, as long as we are very transparent and open about it, and we minimize mistakes and misunderstanding in international discussions, and there's just lots of different way that we do business. However, uh, I've been thinking a, a lot recently about another aspect of this, uh, really stimulated partly by the, the census debate, but reinforced by the government's open data white paper. Uh, and I'd be quite interested in the course of today to pick up any views about the proper relationship between the public and the private sector in the collection, the processing, the dissemination of statistics. The problem being, we hear an awful lot about the importance of users. Users are enormously important. Uh, I publish an interactive database, a very large number of series. It, it gets about 10 million hits every quarter. 
I know almost nothing about almost all of those kids. I'd really like some metadata on the data that is, I know what data have been downloaded, but I don't know what's been done with them. And if I do a user survey, uh, I, I can be pretty confident uh, that I will get a dozen replies from people who are very well known to me, who are using my data for their research purposes or in their small business. But for most of these hits that are done by automation engines, I have no idea what happens to them. That, that worries me a bit <coughs> because I can't have a customer relationship with them. In my, in my department, the use of the word customer is banned because we don't have any customers. We're not charging anyone for anything. If we were, we'd know very clearly what they want. And so I'm rather interested in the idea that, uh, except as in the white paper, we might have a new sort of covenant with end users and with the private sector and not try and do everything ourselves. So if I could have a relationship with a number of major data providers, those who are really expert uh, at picking out information, it could be Bloomberg, it could be Thomson Reuters, it could be some very small businesses that we deal with like Bankshare, <coughs> maybe they would be able to provide the investment and have a very <coughs> low cost, but very customer focused relationship with end users that frankly I'm, I'm never going to be in a position to deliver and I'm not sure that ONS ever will because of the limited resources issue that Sam has talked about. So I'm very interested in that, provision of business statistics through a business route, but I'm also thinking very hard about how we might use administrative data for surveys. Uh, as Graham and Vaughan and, and colleagues at the ONS rely on legislation that's very old, uh, legislation that requires surveys done on paper or face-to-face -face to get useful information. We don't really need to rely on that anymore. There are some advantages that we can get so much data about businesses, about households, about economic and social activity through other means. I'm quite interested in exploring that. And the focus, I mean, Andrew mentioned that he was appointed uh, on the 1st of April last year. On the 1st of April this year, uh, the FSA will be abolished and split into two parts. And the Prudential Regulation Authority will come to the Bank of England and collection of all the regulatory data will come to be my responsibility. There's a lot of duplication there between data that's collected from banks and Royal society, insurers, credit unions, by the FSA, and by my team that works so far on rather traditional statistical surveying principles. So these, these are very important points, very interesting points, very much in my mind, and I hope we can cover some of them quickly. Thank you very much, Mark. I mean, uh, we, we are nearly out of time, but if I can just comment on the on, on the use of admin data, because I, I see Alison Trichard, who works in my team, on, on that very issue, how we can make better use of administrative data um, in, in the way in which we um, process information more quickly, perhaps, in the future. Um, and, and there are there are particular issues for us, uh, uh, legislative issues, in actually getting hold of uh, legal access to that information which we are looking at. So it is something that's very much on our agenda um, as, as we go forward over the next few years. Um, we, we really do need to draw this to a close, I'm afraid, so I, I, I don't think I'm going to have time for, for, for the next question, but I'd like to thank Andrew in particular because he has that, he's about to leave um, uh, back, back off to, to the office for, for the next part of your day. But thank you very, very much for, for coming along and, and opening for us here. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the panel. Thanks.